I don't really know how to start shows. Come on, man. Don't start, don't start liking me now. So, yeah, I'm funny compared to, you know, well, you'll see later. I stand for my I know a lot of fucking idiots. I think a lot of shit is mean-spirited just because it goes against what they believe. But the relief of comedy is it takes things that aren't funny and it allows us to laugh about them for an hour. We got a purple suit to buy and a gigantic coffin. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Hope you can hear me this time. Uh, welcome to another episode of Why Are You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. Uh, today, not in the vaulted podcast studios again, and we won't be for a while. But today, I'm pleased to introduce to you the late, great Robert Schimmel, who is uh, not necessarily a guy you guys may have heard of, but uh, one of my favorites from when I was a kid and very underrated. So I've been uh, you know, eager to do an episode about him since we started this. And uh, just me and Craig today, like I said, no vaulted podcast studios. We, uh, you can hear me now, right? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank Through God. We never had these kind of problems at vaulted. That's all I'll say. <laughs> uh, so you you weren't familiar with Robert Schimmel, right? No, I, I recognize him, but uh, that's about it. Yeah, and that's kind of the career he had. And he's really the prim- one of the greatest stereotypes I can think of for the you know, kind of down on his luck road comic. And now I think if he had lived another, you know, 10, 12 years, uh, he would have had a comic, uh, a podcast where he just bitches about the industry (laughs) because, (laughs) because they never found a role for him for whatever reason, you know, kind of a comics comic type of guy. Um, But I always found him very funny. And I, I think from Howard Stern is probably how I found him. Uh, just stumbled upon him when I was young. So I was like, oh, this guy must be huge if I, you know, found him somehow. But then as I grew up, like anytime I mentioned Robert Schimmel, no one knew who the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> and then uh, like as I was looking into it, I thought certainly there were he had done things that maybe I hadn't heard of. But really, the only reason he lives on is through his stand up, which we'll play some clips later, and the Howard Stern show. Everything else he's been uh, cut out of or uh, just hasn't gotten opportunities, or uh, he had a sitcom that was, you know, kind of cut short. He also had uh, his 11-year-old son died of cancer. Uh, He had a heart attack in the late 90s, followed by getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had to go through chemotherapy. He lost a testicle. Um, Then in 2010, I believe, 2009 or 2010, um, he was diagnosed with cirrhosis, uh, which evolved from hepatitis C that he got from, uh, I think when he was in the Air Force, he spent like a year in the Air Force. And none of the things that I just listed are how he died. So we'll get to that. But he, yeah, he was kind of the like the picture of this like miserable guy who never really got a shot. I shouldn't say miserable guy because um, like on Howard Stern, he was always fun and everything, but just uh, on paper sort of a guy that was down on his luck. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah the, t- the, um, the complainer in the corner type. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, although, you know what's funny is, um, I guess when he died, uh, Dane Cook tweeted out that uh, uh, when R- Dane's parents got sick, Robert called him and like gave him advice and asked how he was and all that type of stuff. And the only reason I mentioned that is because he seems to me like a guy that really would have bitched about Dane Cook's success. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but apparently he was not that guy necessarily um like a kevin brennan type a, li- a little bit but not quite i think more his misery was more uh focused on his marriage and his personal life and things like that um which we'll we'll get to a lot of but for all the like i said all the clips that i have for you today are from the howard stern show and from his stand-up um because other than that he's been cut out a lot of things and and uh never had a real shot so we'll start with the howard stern show and i think right out of the gate he tells us a little bit about his uh family dynamic which was very strange I, i'm surprised you even have another kid i thought you had a bad marriage what well, yeah i don't know but no this is gonna this is gonna be the cement that's gonna really uh wait a minute haven't they like divorced and remarried and stuff yeah like that? four times bob's, <laughs> yeah bob's thinking that like if they have a baby, you know how they tell you never have a kid to try to fix your marriage. Right, so Bob's trying to do it. But they have other kids. Yeah. Well, well that's what they say. And but the that's why I'm going to name this kid Bondo. Yeah. And, and, and Bob, you're no spring chicken, right? I mean, you're like 
What are you? Uh, now I'm in my uh, late forties. Right. And how old's your wife? What's the age gap? She, she just turned uh, forty-three. Man. What's the age gap with the kids? What's the age gap? My oldest one is twenty. And I think he had two kids after this was recorded. <laughs> So Shimble was just cranking out kids. But the funniest part there is uh, his first wife, he had two wives, but went through like four divorces. Mm -hmm. His first wife, they had their marriage annulled. They were legally separated uh, and they were divorced at least once. So, yeah, that, uh, it adds up to the four separations, I guess, however you chop that up. Um, but that, I think, is another good barometer of the misery that he felt that kind of fueled a lot of his comedy you know oh yeah um and i would describe his stand-up he's an interesting mix of like as i was going back and watching old clips i was trying to think of uh you know obvious inspirations or you know who, who influenced him and people he influenced and the best i could come up with it was he's kind of a mix of like woody allen gary shandling and jim norton like i'd be curious if norton was a big shimmel guy because you see a lot there's his act is definitely very dirty mm -hmm. which probably led to him not getting a lot of uh, network stuff and things like that um but he also has like a lot of observational material and he's a little a little there's a nebbishy side to him like even the sexual stuff is very self-deprecating and uh that sort of thing which is like right up my alley you know like that's kind of the perfect mix of a guy i was looking for um when i was a kid but uh, he, he he would talk about like he never got uh, Leno or Letterman. But then there's also an element, and this is the, this is the case of not even necessarily Schimmel, but a lot of guys who aren't as successful as they think they should be. They kind of come up with reasons why they're not successful. Like I heard a clip of uh, Schimmel saying, like I ne I've never been on Letterman, never been on Leno. I was on Conan once. And uh, he goes, I told a joke, this joke, a yeah, dirty joke, and they never asked me back after that. But then he tells the joke, and it's like, I, I can't see Conan banning you for this. The joke was essentially that um, he went to the uh, dentist and got put under anesthesia. And the doctor said, okay, Robert, you're going to feel a little prick in your mouth. And Robert said, all right, Doc, well, you're going to have to crank that up. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like a fairly innocuous joke that doesn't seem like something that would get you kicked off conan so it is kind of funny to hear these guys come up with reasons why uh the industry doesn't necessarily want them you I, you would have to say some pretty horrible shit to get kicked off conan i would think right considering all the stuff you know norm has done like conan's not a uh tight-laced guy necessarily no no he prefers the people say that kind of shit anyway and apologize later yeah, I, I'm actually surprised he wasn't back because I would think Conan would like a weirdo like Schimmel, you know? Yeah. Um. All right. So what's the uh, what's the next clip? Bud Freeman. Oh yeah. So this is a guy. I'm not keep, keeping with the trend of kind of down on his luck. Uh, this is how Robert Schimmel got into comedy. Bud Freeman saw him in uh, Arizona, and then uh, take it away, Robert. Bud Freeman. Uh... <laughs> So what did Bud do? Like Bud let you get up in front on for free or something in front he of? He was the first guy that I, it was. It was him that actually told me to move out. To our, well, he said calling for spots and the and I was that was the first time I went on stage and that's when I went home and told my wife we're gonna quit my job and I'm gonna move out to L.A. I mean, and, get, get... and the place had burnt down. <laughs> <laughs> so again, another great metaphor <laughs> for Robert. Although, like, I think that kind of suits his personality like i couldn't find anything of him talking about that on stage but i think he in in a lot of ways did kind of revel at least artistically revel in his misery so it's sure like that suits him you know yeah um let's keep going we get into by the way we'll you know kind of build robert's uh career and talk about that stuff but we get into one of the wildest stories i've heard play out on radio so we're working our way there yeah, this next one's uh, labeled "Son's Penis." <laughs> yeah, just, I think this is just a good, uh, you know, measurement of Robert's uh, sense of humor. So then uh, they do, but we we go down to fun, and the pediatrician takes off my son's diaper. I swear, I'm not making this up. And the guy goes, 
Mr. Schiller, your son's penis is too big to do here. We got to go to the hospital and do it. Is that true? Yeah, he said that I've been doing it for. He said I've been doing circumcisions for 16 years. This is only the second penis I've ever seen like this. Oh my god! I don't stop the right size thing to do it here. Whoa. Oh my god! So we have to go to the hospital and who's I'm the father? That out because <laughs> nurses from other departments are volunteering to assist in the circumcision. Wow. Can you imagine your penis needs major your, surgery? Your baby's penis. Are you, are you? Dressing. Obviously, it skipped a generation. That's what I was going to say. Are you small? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Are you proud or do you feel like, oh, man. I should take a full page out on the trades. <laughs> <laughs> I believe, uh, I believe Howard followed that up later with, is this the son that replaced your other kid? <laughs> Referring to the one that died of cancer. <laughs> so <laughs> those, were, those were the days on Stern. <laughs> You can also, and that's that. You know, that's what Stern did. Where you can also kind of consider this a Howard Stern episode. I had someone um, reach out to me recently and say uh, that they liked the OJ on Stern episode. Are, we, are you thinking of doing any more episodes about Stern? And we'll definitely do a bunch. But uh, you know, at some point, try and spread them out a little bit. But the reason this one is stern, so Stern heavy, like I said, is that's kind of why Schimmel has a name. And I think that was the case with a lot of guys. Uh, whether it be Opie and Anthony or Howard Stern, you know, the reason we know them is because this radio show gave them a platform that uh, Hollywood certainly would not have. Um, even to the point where uh, in that interview that we just listened to, that uh, phone call, Schimmel was calling into the Stern show to basically ask them, he was uh, up for some comedy award that I think Comedy Central was doing. And he was against like Carlos Mencia and Pablo Francisco and that 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 ilk. And uh, he was in last place at the time. So he called in to Stern and obviously rocketed to the top. He won whatever poll they were doing. And Comedy Central had to change the way they measured the award due to what they called unfair lobbying, <laughs> <laughs> which was the uh, the impact that Howard had at the time, obviously. Uh, all right. So what's next? First divorce. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a, there's a plenty of these stories. Robert's love life was uh, pretty wild, if you want to call it that. But let's hear a little bit about the first one. The publicity. Did you have a what? legal separation when you guys got uh, separated? We were divorced. You were divorced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were talking about legal. You didn't know that about your parents? <laughs> oh. You didn't know your parents were divorced? I, I have cousins my age, and they all knew, and they were just told not to tell me. So one day I'm listening to the, a radio show, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh. Hey, your father's weird, man. Yeah, no, we were married, and we were married for about six months. That's how it started. We got right. married. Well, here's what happened. We wanted to get married. Her parents said no. Right. No way. You're not ready to get married. And I said, hey, they're not going to tell us what to do. So to punish them, <laughs> right. we got married. Right. And I'm still punishing them 23 years later. <laughs> so you got married, and then you got divorced. When was the first time? No, first we got annulled six months later. All right, that was the annulment. Look, at she's like in shock, your oh, kid. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> was she around when you were Oh, not then. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no she okay. wasn't even conceived yet. Okay. So. You got annulled. Yes. And then you decided to get back together. You had to get remarried. How long yeah. before you got remarried after the annulment? About a year. We started <laughs> seeing each other again. And okay. then uh, and then uh, we got married secretly in Las Vegas. <laughs> but then she still stayed with her parents and I stayed with my parents. And then she got pregnant with Jess. And one day when she was starting the show, her mother said, you know, what's with you? And she said, you know, I'm like four months pregnant. And she right. said, pregnant? And my wife said, it's not what you think, Bob. Right. I are married. Right, right. And she said, what are you living at home for? Yeah, right. <laughs> so so uh, there's a lot there that I should uh, address. Um, a, he hit the triple crown of uh, horrible marriages with one woman. It was pretty impressive. But also the uh, female voice that you heard there, other than Robin, was obviously Bob's daughter, Jess, uh, his oldest oldest child, I believe. Um, oh, obviously, based on what he said there. <laughs> but uh, the f very interesting thing about her being on the show was it kind of leads to the segment that I was talking about earlier where uh, Robert comes in to Howard one day to get, promote his gigs and talk about getting uh, kicked off Hollywood Squares, which we'll talk about. And uh, his daughter was with him. And he says, I guess I should bring my daughter in she had this one story she was going to tell and that's all but it seems very naive to not think that howard would uh you know poke at that a little bit uh there was a good interaction between them though where howard asks uh robert if his daughter will get in a bikini 
And Robert said, absolutely. If you bring your daughter in, <laughs> Howard goes, well, let's call this one a standoff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Robert was a guy you can tell. And I don't know how much he was in on it where he knew she was going to you know, tell a little more than the, this one story about her boyfriend selling his underwear, which they never got to, by the way, <laughs> because, because of the other stuff uh, his daughter's about to bring up. But you can tell in every appearance of Schimmel on Howard, uh, you can definitely tell that he's like, well, this is my shot. This is my home. This is where I'm building my audience. So I have to play along. Like, I have to give these people something. And at least the you know clips that I've heard, and most of it is on YouTube, um, he, he generally delivered based on a lot of his misery. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, his the, the story that his daughter tells. I think we mix in a couple of his um, uh, the things he's been cut out of. So I don't know if that's coming next or not. Uh, we got cheating. Oh, yeah. So let's hear a little bit, a bit about that first. So, yeah. Oh, the other weird thing from that clip was uh, they didn't tell their daughter they were divorced for a while. And like Robert just wasn't at the house for months on end. And I guess as a kid, she was like, oh, I mean, he's a comedian. He travels. That must be why he's not around. <laughs> so they had a very, very strange family. But this is uh, some of the hijinks that Robert got into. Your daughter. I, you know, one time I had a fight with my wife and I said, look, if you don't like it, you don't have to be here when I get back. Not knowing that when I got back, she really wouldn't be there. <laughs> Literally, all the stuff was gone. Yeah. And there was a note saying goodbye. Right. I finally, I finally, you know, after hearing it on the radio, I took my mom out one night and I got her, gave her some wine. She's a little tipsy. Right. I started I don't asking know her about this stuff, you know, saying, well, where was this? And she's like, oh, we were separated. And he, I got into the car because I, we were supposed to go on a date and there were wine glasses and women's underwear in the car. <laughs> Someone else. Oh, 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 man, Bob. <laughs> oh, you said that you sold your wedding ring to buy wine for this girl. <laughs> Is that true? And so now I, I didn't see you guys. It was at a pawn shop. I could have got it back. <laughs> He's, you hear in his voice there, too, where he goes, I don't know this story. You can hear the panic starting to set in. Yeah. He's like, okay, she's a little more comfortable than I expected her to be on the show. <laughs> she's, she's like a vet. <laughs> yeah, right. She got right into it. But, uh, and by the way, you know, in comparison to other episodes we've done, I realize like some of you, especially the ones that have no idea who Robert Schimmel is, are probably thinking this is very narrow. Like, you know, I went through a few interviews and a few of his, I mean, I went through all his, stand-up specials, but have a few of his stand-up clips. Um, and that's because that's how I found Robert Schimmel. So because he's kind of an unknown guy, like we'll talk a lot about his life, but I also kind of wanted to present what, uh, you know, what charmed me into liking him for lack of a better term. So I hope this kind of leads to some people going into a uh, Robert Schimmel deep dive on YouTube. Um, so what's next from this uh, illustrious Stern interview? This is called Great Excuses. Oh, he's the best. He's the he's the he, he was the master of uh, coming up with excuses that clearly no one would believe, which almost makes you think that they're real. Uh, but this is an example. Right. What happened with the diaphragm? No, we were separated. But right. My wife and I were trying to reconcile. Okay. She lived in a different apartment. Right. And I lived in this place. And I went out with this. Not went out. We went to play racquetball. He's got to get the story straight. No. Yes. <laughs> So we to play racquetball with a comedian. We played racquetball with this with this female comedian, what and we used to write together. Was it was a but she still, popped no, her diaphragm out. Of course, it was. Uh, <laughs> no, it was in the afternoon. Right. We played racquetball, right? And then she came back to the apartment, and she said, "Listen, she had an acting class, and she said, is it okay if I shower before I go over there?'" Yeah. And I said, "Okay, uh, yeah, and I'll so, watch." And how's the diaphragm wind up on the ninth and, man? And she was, she was a pretty good actress because she acted like Carl Lewis and ran out of there very fast and my wife barged in. Right. So you're telling me. No, that. she came out of the shower wearing my wife's robe and my wife just happened to come over to say, look, I really want things to work. And there's the girl dripping wet in front of her. <laughs> and she ran out and I told my wife, it's not what you think. We were playing racquetball and I went to pick up the girl's pocketbook to give it to her and her diaphragm case fell out. Uh, my wife said, oh, that guess, always happens. Yeah. She said, it's this one of the rackets <laughs> right uh... yeah. so, and that like when you listen to shimmel with howard howard obviously does a great job of like you know uh, questioning him and following up on some of these stories and the way shimmel tells a lot of these stories and uh throws these excuses out it's like 
even as the audience that's only hearing his side, you don't quite believe him because he's not even completely trying to sell you on it. It's right. like you were you were definitely cheating on your wife, right? That's what was happening here. <laughs> sure. so, so that's the kind of uh, uh, you know charm that he has, and I think it says a lot about him also. That th- 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 and it speaks to the weirdness I was mentioning. Like, don't forget his daughter is sitting right next to him, who's only I think twenty or twenty one at the time when they're doing this interview. So his daughter's sitting right next to him. He's talking about cheating on his wife and being with these other women and things like that. It's a very bizarre uh, uh, dynamic, which you can kind of see why, you know, Hollywood maybe didn't understand this guy, you know, because you couldn't necessarily categorize him as any one thing. Like he has a, uh, we'll talk a little later, he did get a sitcom deal, but I don't know that I could see him as a traditional sitcom dad. Or maybe I could, but I don't know that it would have been the best role for him. You know what I mean? Like now it would be very easy to put him to to kind of find a role in a you know a single cam like FX or HBO style comedy. But I think it would have been uh, you know a misuse of his personality to just make him a wacky you know multi cam sitcom dad. Could have made him uh, a sitcom dad if he played someone similar to like what he. Like these stories he's telling. <laughs> yeah, a toned down version of himself, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, right. Yeah. But just, I, yes, right. They would have had to find that role. It couldn't just be like, you know, your regular dopey family man, you know? Yeah, um, he's not He's not playing uh, uh, Pete Holmes' character in that bowling show. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I guess neither is Pete Holmes, but. Yeah. Get- well, so, so I might as well just say it since we're talking about it. He, uh, he did get a sitcom with Fox, I believe in 2008 or nine uh oh no you know what it might have been before that actually because he says after that he was uh it was when he was diagnosed with cancer um which is why he lost the sitcom or ended the sitcom because he wasn't in good enough health to uh do it i think the pilot is somewhere on the internet it might even be on youtube but uh fun fact brie larson played his daughter so maybe it would have been been great who knows (laughs) um all right what's next uh, Hollywood Squares. Okay, yeah. So now this starts off with this is uh, discussing things he's uh, been kicked out of or kicked off of or edited out of. Um, and this was his Hollywood Squares appearance um, from back. And now Hollywood Squares, don't forget, I, I think we played a clip in the Gilbert episode, right? Sure did. You forget that was that was like a pretty big deal back in the day. Like I remember that was yeah. on. I think that was on. At least this is my memory of it. Being on, like, you know, on one channel, you had Jeopardy every night, and on another channel, you had Hollywood Squares at 7 o'clock. Um, that's how I remember it being at the time. I don't know if that's the case, but it was a big deal when they rebooted it with, like, Whoopi Goldberg and all these characters. So they bring Robert Schimmel in, and uh, this is what got him booted. I'm sitting next to Whoopi, and the question was, if you're reaching for your mashie or your niblick, what activity are you involved in? And I said, playing Twister with Louie Anderson. <laughs> and the grid started laughing, and all of a sudden, they stopped tape, and there was a huddle. And uh, <laughs> really, they stopped tape. And the people were talking, and they were, well, Louie films Family Feud there. Mm. And uh, and they, made, they, they they had a discussion. See, when I did it, they just edited everything out. Right, I said, no well, that's why I don't know what's going to happen. So then they came back, and they said, we're going to ask you another question. So all right, said, so they okay. stopped tape, and they got rid of that question, and they said, we're starting a new one. They said the term a pig in the poke refers to what? And I said spending the night with Louis Anderson. <laughs> and uh, Adam Carolla was sitting up above me and I heard him stamping his feet on the thing. So, so uh, alluding to some things, by the way, when we talked about Louis Anderson, some things Louis may not have wanted out there at the time because uh, that wasn't allowed. For, it's, it's amazing to think back, you know, 20 years later or whatever. Uh, your game show hosts weren't allowed to be gay. <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> a very strange thought process the country had, but uh, very funny. And again, th- that stuff like that is why I think had Schimmel been alive today, and now he would have been a much older man if he were alive. So maybe this isn't the case. But you know, if he were kind of in his prime today, um, I think he would have fit in a lot better in this era because people would have found something for him, and I think it would have been relatively easy now to find something for him because he's not you know so filthy that he could never be on television or anything like that you know i think he was just a little bit weird and you know hollywood what they just i don't think they did any work 
to find anything for me, you know? Right. Um, so that was, by the way, edited. I don't think they can completely edit him out of Hollywood Squares, but uh, at least the good stuff, I believe, was cut out. <laughs> and then um, Comedy Central, like we know now the Comedy Central roasts, they've had, you know, Trump and Rob Lowe and James Franco and Saget and all these people. But they started with just airing the Friars Club roasts. Yep. And so uh, I guess because King of Queens started, I don't know what the occasion was necessarily, but uh, Jerry Stiller was a member of the Friars Club forever. And they said, we're going to roast him. And uh, so this Bob Schimmel was invited. That's kind of a big opportunity because it was televised on Comedy Central. And so this was Bob's experience with the Jerry Stiller roast. So I was on there. What did, what did I say? Oh, I said that Jerry Stiller is a very nice guy. Right. And that he's always, no matter where he's been in his career, he's helped, uh, had a helping hand for other comics. And one day this comic came over to him in a club and said, Mr. Stiller, I'm a big fan of yours. And I've been doing comedy for about eight years and I can't seem to get anywhere. And I don't know if there's anything you can do to help me. And the Jerry said that if you let me uh, perform some kind of uh, oral. Uh, oh. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> That's okay. Thank you. On you uh, that I'll give you, you know, that I'll I'll do everything I can to help you. And right. the comedian said yes. And that comic today is Ellen DeGeneres. Well, that uh, that did not go over. No, no, nobody liked that. No. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a trick joke. Because I used a word in there that would make people believe that it really was going to be a guy I was right. talking about. Right. Yeah, you fooled them. But I'm out. So then here's what happens. They tell, they cut you out of the entire roast, and they say that it was because of time that the show ran too long, and they had they to had wait. to eliminate you completely. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but the the bad part is I was in the pre-show, uh, the party, the pre roast party interview stuff so people are seeing me on that but thinking you hey you're going to be on there right, and then i'm right. never on uh, there you go well that's that's, that's unreal story of your life is what <laughs> and i so i went back the ro that roast is on youtube as well and i went back and wa skimmed through it to see if shimmel was in it and there's a little clip where he appears in the very beginning you can spot him but <laughs> that's it <laughs> which is very weird which is also funny because I, I'm sure they edited it out, but like in the roast of uh, Louis J. Gomez um, that I attended, Ari Shafir was on the on the dais. But when they released it on YouTube, he didn't want to be a he didn't know they were going to release it anywhere, so he didn't want to be a part of it. So he wouldn't let Louis uh, release Ari's uh, chunk of the roast. So if you're watching it for the first time and know nothing about this, you're seeing every comic go up and make a joke about Ari Shafir, and Ari Shafir never goes up. <laughs> if you have Gas Digital, I think you can see him. Okay, good. So go that's, go find that's, that. That's where I saw it, and I yeah. did see him. I hated right. that roast. Well, I enjoyed it, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, my point is, it's very funny that Schimmel just keeps getting cut out of these things. Uh, I think there's something he did for VH1 that he was edited out of. Like the guy just had a bad. On, uh, to use a Stern reference, he had the same luck as Eric the actor. Quite honestly, <laughs> is that everything, everything he had just failed. It seemed like, um, except for stand up, which I think, like in the 80s and 90s, you know, I know you had the comedy boom in the 80s and everything, but. Uh, you know, you could carve out a career as just a stand-up, but it wasn't viewed as in any high regard, really. You know what I mean? Like, if you were just a stand-up, then you were not a celebrity. You right. were not a star by any means. Unless you um, had a sitcom with it. Exactly. Yeah, you had to have a sitcom or host a late-night show or a game show or something. You had to have something else to go with it. Whereas now, that's not the case at all. I mean, I guess you kind of, in some ways, you have to have a podcast or something like that to kind of grow your audience. But there are some guys like Jim Gaffigan who and Brian Regan who really just built their career doing stand-up. You know, Jim Gaffigan had that show on IFC, but he, he didn't gain notoriety through that. People watched because it was the Jim Gaffigan show. Right. You know, so I think now this era would have been a lot easier for a guy like Schimmel to thrive because he kind of was the definition of a comics comic where, you know, Colin Quinn is probably Colin Quinn and David Teller, the two guys that they say, you know, comics comic. And it really just applies because they haven't gotten anything in the industry necessarily. I mean, obviously, Colin was on SNL and had tough crowd, but neither of them lasted very long. Um, 
but when you look at Colin, you look at something he did like Tough Crowd or like Cop Show that was on YouTube that nobody picked up. And you think like, how could these things fail? So it doesn't really make sense that he's a comics comic. Louis C.K. was considered a comics comic and then obviously blew up. Whereas Schimmel, I think that role suited him best. Where like, you know, maybe he could have been a late night talk show. Like he's a very good guest on Stern. Maybe he could have been a talk show host or something like that. But I think he would have just been better off in an era where, you know, you could do your stand up and become a star from that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So I think we get back into uh, some of the chaos that is Robert's life uh, with our next clip. Yeah, this one's called Daughter's Friend. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is the wild thing I was telling you about. And it's very what's very funny about this. Try and keep this in mind, folks, is that Robert brought his daughter in to tell this story again, they never really got to it. So apparently uh, Jess, his daughter, Jess's boyfriend was trying to sell Robert's underwear on like eBay or something. And the reason I can't provide a lot of context is because they never really got there due to this story. So it's very funny to think of Schimmel. Well, ah, my daughter will come on. She'll be a little radio celebrity for five minutes and it'll be a fun father daughter activity. And then his daughter brings this story up. Uh, Jesse, how did he even get your friend's number, and, and did your friend call you immediately and say your dad just called me, or no, no, because Jessica was, was there. I was there. Oh, I, I see. Just come up. You you have that. You had left the room for a few minutes. I left for you. He's such a baby. He can't be alone for five right. seconds. You left him. I left the room. Right. You don't understand. He's screaming at the nurse saying, it can't be like this for everyone. It's so painful. <laughs> you know? right. so it it was. Well, I mean, that, it was. It was like, it was. Making me what a baby. pain medicine. You know? and, like, meanwhile, there's kid, kids with cancer sitting there, like, not even complaining. <laughs> laughing at them. Hey, but they don't feel my pain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, like, Never mind those kids with cancer. It's... So she tells me, she's like, you know, I just wanted to let you know that your dad called and asked me to come by at one in the morning and keep him company. And I said, <laughs> Knowing, I said, but your daughter's there. Right. And he's like, it's okay anyways. <laughs> you don't care. So, wow. wow. Did that freak you out? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. She didn't talk to me for a little while. Yeah. Neither did you didn't my tell wife. You, you didn't tell your else. mom, did you? Uh-huh. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. oh, no. She showed up. <laughs> She was the friend who no, showed is, up. <laughs> Bob, my wife showed up. At the Bob, hospital. Bob, you say this stuff like it's, like it's like, no matter. It fact. happens to everyone. Right. Well, he said he goes, but you weren't here for me, and she's like, well, we have a nine-month-old baby. I had to take home and take oh, care. Oh, that's right. You yeah. are just disgusting. So. <laughs> you are just disgusting. It's funny. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I was in surgery. Yeah, you oh, oh, excuse me. He said he didn't like care he might have died, and he figured he didn't care what he did before he died. <laughs> right. <laughs> Isn't that wild? She's a natural. She really, she, she's a, she gets her storytelling from her father, it seems. But it's so funny to hear Howard in there kind of like like laughing and all, like stunned by the way Robert is handling it. Because Howard at the time is a guy who's bringing in, you know, homeless midgets to do math versus strippers. And even he's shocked by how calm Robert is when he's like, yeah, you know, that's that's what happens. I called my daughter's friend. It was no big deal. I needed company. <laughs> He's like, no big deal, dude. <laughs> yeah, what are you talking about? So Robert does say he doesn't have any memory of it, which the only reason I believe is because his daughter was also there. Mm -hmm. And they said that, like, so I guess the friend ended up coming and the three of them spent the night in this hospital room <laughs> together. <laughs> and so it's very weird. And I think they carried on some kind of relationship afterwards. So what Robert goes on to tell Howard and he calls him the next day with this story as well. Um, he's very frustrated because they don't have all the facts, right? So I'll tell that in a minute. Cause I don't want to step on Robert's toes, but uh, what, what's the next clip phone call. Yeah. So I believe this is, um, uh, we'll just let's play it. <laughs> so then I call back on Friday and I tell my wife, well, I hear first I go home and I tell my wife, okay, look, you know what? I was I stepped over the line. I'm right. flirting with the girl. I admit it. You caught me. I mean, I'm not going to say it didn't happen. Right. I'm going to put an end to it right now. Right. And I pick up the phone and I pause one second. I'm sorry. Look, I can't. So this is I believe with the same girl. I believe with the 25 year old. But this is uh, they're out of the hospital now. He had just gotten home, and this is uh, doing some online chatting of some kind. Like I think the way he described it, I couldn't tell if it was the early days of like video chatting or just online messaging. 
Um, but uh, th- that's what the setup was for this. I'm not going to say it didn't happen. Right. I'm going to put an end to it right now. Right. I picked up the phone and I dialed the number and I said, look, I can't. Don't call me. It's in front of your wife. You call. Yeah. All right. Don't uh, email me. I'm not- Seems like email, but it was 99. So uh, instant message. Is that the end of the clip? Yeah. Is there, is there, what's the next one? Uh, looks changed. Okay. They, they should have gone on uh, a little longer, but the, the, basically the punchline to that is that, you know, he makes the phone call and says, uh, you know, I can't, uh, can't do this anymore. I have a wife, blah, blah, blah. And his wife says, uh, may I, l- let me talk. And she grabs the phone and you just hear uh, at 7 p.m. Toy Story. <laughs> like you just dialed movie phone <laughs> and wasn't talking to anybody. <laughs> so he was just trying to get away with another lie. He really is the, the greatest for, as far as just horrible marriage stories go. It's like he's the greatest, but he's also a pile of shit. Yeah, he is a bit of a, a shit bag, <laughs> which is why I like him. But uh, all right. So uh, what's the next? He said looks changed. Yeah, his looks like his looks changed. Oh right, yes. Okay, let's uh, let's play that. So I get home <laughs> now. I don't know if you've ever had this where you've had to go to the bathroom and you can hold it because you know you're almost home. Right. Yeah. That's the way I was feeling, and it was uh, number two. It was number two, and uh, she wouldn't let you in the house. She wasn't home, and the and doors the locks, and the locks were changed. Have been you, changed. You, you the guy work. drops me off. The key doesn't work. I'm walking around the house. You got the windows go. unlocked. The right. garage is locked. The back door is locked. The sliding glass door is blocked. Right. So I had to. Uh, you're pinching your cheeks. Uh, no, my pants were down, and I was squatting in the backyard next to the two golden retrievers. So you went to the bathroom outdoors. Yep. Right in the backyard. What did you use your paper? She oh. came home. Oh, my God. You she, caught me. <laughs> she caught you defecating. defecating. Defecating in the backyard. Oh, my God. Jeez. And wow. I said I didn't have a key. And uh, she said, why didn't you go at your girlfriend's house? <laughs> <laughs> he said that the uh, redemption in that story, I guess, was that uh, his daughter's boyfriend uh was the one who would like clean up their yard as far as like dog shit goes. Like they had a dog and mm-hmm. he would use the pooper scooper to clean up the dog. And uh, so he said, you know, he puffed out his chest a little knowing that his daughter's boyfriend had to clean that up apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the, that's the type of guy that built uh, Robert Schimmel evidently. And I, by the way, that locks changing story is uh I believe the first clip, I think that's how I was introduced to Robert Schimmel. I must have just stumbled upon it on YouTube, I guess. I don't really remember. But I remember that being the first story of this man who couldn't get into his home, shitting in his yard. (laughs) 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 And and, uh, uh, I was like, this guy is this guy's gold. Um, (laughs) uh, Were there any more stern clips or no? Um, We got no. I'll stand up. Yeah, so to just tie a bow on that, uh, the whole daughter, the daughter's friend fiasco, um, he called in a couple days later uh, with a much more somber tone. So, A, uh, his, his daughter told the school there was a death in the family, and that's why she wouldn't be attending for however many days. And then she goes on Howard Stern, obviously. So she had to deal with some sort of backlash from that. But also, um, his wife called him because everyone they know now heard this story about the daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his defense of himself was basically that they weren't friends. It's like Howard was under the impression that it was just some girl that like his daughter grew up with. So, you know, Robert has watched her since she was eight years old. Evidently, what it was was his daughter's current boss who was 25 at the time when his daughter was 21. So I think Mm -hmm. they like became work friends. Not that that makes it any less weird, but it It does. does. It changes your mindset on it. You know what I mean? Like I'm saying as far as the, as far as the daughter, it doesn't make it any less weird. Yeah. He's not driving her to soccer practice. Yeah. He wasn't grooming her. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, that was his defense, but he called in to Stern to kind of talk about the tremendous shit show that was going on in his life. Um, and so, you know, like we're illustrating kind of a, a a fun scumbaggery to Robert Schimmel. But there was in 2009, he was arrested for 
um, a dispute with his wife. There weren't a lot of facts with that. Like I said, he was arrested. Um, so I don't know. I assume it got physical. I'm not really sure. I don't know a lot about it. Um, but he had confrontations with his uh, second wife. So, you know, th there is a dark side to Robert Schimmel that I don't know a ton about, really. Um, but f from a comedic standpoint, that's kind of how comedians are made. Like, I don't know if you if you enjoy comedy. I don't know if you're going to find a lot of guys who are necessarily Boy Scouts. Like, even Seinfeld's probably the cleanest cut comedian, and he was dating a 17-year-old when he was the most famous guy in the world. So, you know, everyone has their, their darkness to them. But I just wanted to play, uh, before we get out of here, a few clips of Robert's stand-up that I've been talking about. Because I figured we can't, uh, you know, leave you guys hanging. I've been talking about this guy's stand-up. Um, so we start with a couple clips from his um, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, Young Comedian special, right? No, uh, first one is called Chemo. Oh, well, well, let's skip that one for now. Let's play that after these. Um, let's play the uh, Dangerfield clips. He's another guy who was helped out by Rodney Dangerfield. It feels like everyone we talk about, uh, Dice, Roseanne, um, I, I, the, some that come to mind that we haven't talked about, like Ray Romano, got to start on there. That mm -hmm. Dangerfield Young Comedian special is where a lot of a lot of uh, you know great comics got their start, and uh, this was Schimmel on there. People try a lot of weird stuff. You know, I went out with a girl once. She said, "You want to have the most unbelievable orgasm in the world?" No. <laughs> she said, "I'm going to stick a knotted rag up your ass." I said, "No, you're not." <laughs> she said no look look i'm gonna stick it up there see and just when you're ready to come i'm gonna yank it out and it's gonna be like the fourth of july well i don't know about you guys but when it comes to my ass i don't like the word yank right off the bat i said you know honey i don't want to rag up my ass she said how about a string of beads said, what are you monty hall this isn't let's make a deal here what are you but I figure you only go around this crazy old world once, so what the fuck? Yeah, so I'm at the hospital getting the beads removed. <laughs> I thought to pull the string and I came like a wildcat. <laughs> <laughs> So then that that's like, like I said, that's kind of the, you know, filthy angle of Schimmel, who, by the way, I think in that this thing we're playing from HBO, he's like 38. So he's kind of one of these guys that, like I said, not that he super broke out or anything, but he gained a lot more notoriety in his, uh, you know, I mean, I would say 40s and 50s, even more than his 30s. Um, so. He, uh, th this joke, by the way. Oh, well, no, this I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, that's what I wanted to say. That's where I feel like a guy like Norton was influenced by Schimmel. You can hear a little bit of that. Like, I would describe it almost as like 80s filthy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you're going to be on HBO in the 80s, that's the version of filthy, um, that was passable at that time, I think. But he also had, like, I think the joke right after that is he talks about, uh, he goes, why, why are uh, asteroids called asteroids and hemorrhoids called hemorrhoids? Because I guess that would make a proctologist an astronaut. <laughs> so he has like Hedberg type, you know, observational shit as well. And all like very self-deprecating stuff. So he's a little like, as far as style, I guess you could say all over the place. But he, I think, found a good way to refine it. Mm -hmm. So um, I take it back. I just real, I just remembered. This next joke is how I discovered uh, Robert Schimmel. <laughs> you feel uh, personally attacked? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's about my people. But um, Comedy Central, if you remember, in the early 2000s, made a list of the 100 greatest stand-ups. And they aired it in like four parts or something on Comedy Central. And Robert Schimmel was on that list. He was like somewhere in the 70s, I think. Which, it, it was. it's an interesting list. Because they have guys like Schimmel on there who, who you're like, oh, wow maybe they had some respect for like underrated comics, but they also had like Jim Brewer on there. So it's like, I, I don't know were they just pulling people who were around at the time. It was a very weird list. I thought, hmm. um, but anyways, uh, the clip, one of the clips they showed when they were talking about Schimmel was, uh, this joke that attacks my people. It was very hurtful. 
How do blind people know when they're done wiping their ass? He's the originator of that one. Honey, could you come here for a minute? I need you to proofread something for me. <laughs> I just think that was so wrong. The word proofread, I love yeah. in that content. I need you to proofread something for me. That's very fun. <laughs> but that is, uh, you know, that holds a place near and dear in my heart because I get that question all the time. And to the point where, like, it, at least in the blind community, it's a hack question. And the proof that it's hack is that Schimmel was doing it in the 80s, for Christ's sake. No kidding. <laughs> so next time you think of asking me that, don't. It's been done. We got it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought that was a great joke, and that made me laugh. Obviously, I had some personal connection to it. So I think that's when I went down the uh, rabbit hole of Schimmel and found the clip of him shitting on his wife's front lawn. <laughs> but <laughs> um, So now let's play the uh, chemotherapy clip, because, uh, you know, the 80s stuff w was a lot of that. There was some personal stories, some observational stuff, that sort of thing. Um, but I think his, uh, you know, swan song for lack of a better term was, uh, I believe the special was called life since then, um, which was his last special came out in 2008. And he talks a lot about having cancer and, um, dealing with his kids growing up and things like that. And I think it was maybe his most personal special, I thought. And, uh, this is a, a bit from that. <laughs> I remember the first day I went to uh, chemotherapy, uh, I walked into the infusion center and it's, it's staggering the first time you go in there. Um, you know that, that poster, The Evolution of Man? It's like that in reverse. I walk in and I look pretty much like I do now. And then I look down the beds and I see people losing their hair, people really sick, and that's what I'm going to be turning into. And I sat down on the seat, they're hooking me up for the IV, and there's a guy next to me, and I said, uh, how you doing? He said, how do you think I'm doing? I have cancer. I said, me too. He said, good for you. <laughs> wow, how many more of these treatments do I have? So the nurse comes over and says, Robert, you know what, change your seat. This guy's got a bad attitude. You don't need to be around that. He's angry at the world. You know, you need all your energy to stay positive. And I couldn't change my seat because I had to know what made him turn into that because I didn't want to become him. And I felt challenged to make him laugh, no matter how shitty the circumstances were. So I sat down and I said, did you go to any support group meetings? And he said, nah, I don't believe in that shit. I don't want to hear people piss and moan about their problems. I got my own thing. And I said, well, I went last night because... Uh, you know, I wanted to be prepared for today. And uh, there was a lady that was there and she was crying and she said, you know, I'm going to lose one of my breasts and I, I'm afraid my husband is not going to find me sexy anymore. And I said, I was looking at this lady thinking, you wouldn't be sexy with three tits. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy fell out of his fucking chair. <laughs> this guy... It's true. My treatments were every 21 days. 21 days later, I go back for my next chemo. That guy was saving a seat for me and told me dirty jokes for four hours. <laughs> and when I did my first show after that, he was front row at my first show. It was really fucking cool. Really was. <laughs> yeah, so I think like all the, the shit that happened in his life culminated in what I think was his best special. Um, and he was nearing 60 when he did it, which is pretty rare to have your, you know, uh, again, maybe it's not if you're a diehard Schimmel fan, maybe you'll correct me um, and say, you know, unprotected is better or something like that. But uh, I think it's pretty rare to have such a great special in your, you know, late 50s. Uh, by the way, shame on me for not telling this earlier in the podcast, uh, what is, which is one of my favorite it's not even really a Robert Schimmel story as much as, as it is a Dan Ninen story, but I want to shoehorn it in here. Um, do you remember Dan Ninen, Craig? I remember the name. Recently. We, we, yeah, we talked about him in the uh, joke stealing episode with Russell Peters. Yes, 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 he, yes. He yes, did yes. more than steal his joke. He almost stole like Russell Peters' identity, essentially. Right. 
Right. But Dan Nine, very bad guy, very weird guy. We'll have to do an episode on him at some point, maybe. Um, but Robert Schimmel was one of his victims. So uh, if you don't remember Dan Nynan, he was a guy. And what he did with Russell Peters and Mark Marin was um, send these like emails to clubs and say, hey, uh, this is Russell Peters' manager. Um, I, Russell, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he alerted you guys, but he likes to bring this kid Dan Nynan on the road to open for him. And the club would say, all right, I don't give a fuck. And Russell Peters would show up and this guy would be there. And he's like, oh, okay, this guy's opening for me. Then Russell Peters is in a few different cities. And he's like, how come everywhere I go, this Dan Nynan guy is opening for me? (laughs) And sure enough, he figured it out. And uh, another thing Nynan did is bought Russell Peters with one L dot com. Um, Marin talks about Dan Nynan because Dan sent some email like berating Marin. So Schimmel was one of his victims in these little schemes he would run. Like he would open for Robert Schimmel a bunch on the road. And when Robert Schimmel died, and by the way, Bob Schimmel's death was not a pleasant experience. Not He didn't live a life and then, you know, peacefully died of old age. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But Dan Nynan sent an email to Bob Schimmel's brother, just berating him. And saying uh, what a shitty person Bob Schimmel was. And he never laughed at any of Dan's jokes and all these things. So Schimmel on the Dan Nynan hit list, uh, I guess you could put as one of his credits in his career. That definitely needs an episode. Dan Nynan, very weird guy. But yeah, I I wish I could find more on that. The best I could find was like Nick Mullen um, and a couple other guys talking about it. I couldn't find Schimmel ever addressing it or anything. But yeah, evidently he would, you know, email these clubs and say, hey, Robert Schimmel wants me to open for him. And Schimmel just one day was like, I feel like I know this guy. Wasn't he in Washington, D.C. or something? Yeah, we're in Tallahassee. (laughs) It's very weird. What are the odds? (laughs) Um, All right. So uh, we got a couple more stand up clips, right? Yep. Um, From one of his late night shows. Uh, What's this one titled? Siegfried and Roy. Oh, yeah. So this is, by the way, was a big topic at the time. Do you, do you remember that at all? Do I remember them or like that story? Yes. Yes. Uh, Siegfried and Roy got attacked by their tiger. It was very uh, tragic. But I remember that being a big news story at the time. And so this was uh, Schimmel on Conan, actually, like we talked about earlier. Well, they do. They told the story that some lady in the audience had a weird hairdo, and that's why the tiger attacked Roy. I mean, I'm not an authority on tigers, but I have a different theory. Like, it's a wild animal, and they belong in the jungle and not loose on stage. You know, tigers in the jungle have to hunt their prey and catch them and kill them and drag them off. In Vegas, the tiger can sit on his ass, and the prey will walk right up to him. And he said the tiger wasn't trying to attack Roy. He was trying to protect him. Yeah. Here, why don't you hide in my stomach? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, All right. And then uh, we'll play one last clip before we uh, get out of here. This is uh, the SeaWorld one, right? Yep. All right. So let's see. Uh, He takes his daughter to SeaWorld. This is uh, another great bit. And again, I feel like I hope I did a good job kind of putting in an eclectic mix of Schimmel's jokes. Like he really wasn't a one note guy, which I feel like is a little rare for, uh, you know, just kind of a road comic, you know, like um, not comparing him to David Tell. I don't think he's anywhere near the comedian that Tell is, but it tells like that where you couldn't put a Tell in a box categorically. You know what I mean? Like he talks about a bunch of different weird shit. And I think Schimmel was, you know, to a much smaller extent, kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, SeaWorld you want, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I took my kids. She wanted to swim with dolphins. She saw this thing, swim with the dolphins. Well, first of all, you don't get to swim with them. You got to stand like that. Because if you move, they think you're food. So (laughs) you have to wait on a list. It's like six months. I mean, people are getting liver transplants before you get to swim with a dolphin. (laughs) And it's true. You get a beeper. Where it goes off, you got like six hours to get to SeaWorld. So (laughs) we get to this place. It's a lot of money. And I tell my daughter, look, why don't you walk near the edge of the pool? And I'll push you. You fall in. 
swim out there, pet them a couple of times, and then scream for help. You know, because they'll pull you out. You get free T-shirts, free, you know, have pictures, everything. So she doesn't want to do it like that. My wife says, Bob, you're her dad. You're supposed to set some kind of example. So I slip and fall in there. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so like I said, he can be completely filthy or just have kind of like an innocent uh, dad joke like that. Um, so yeah, I, I like Robert Schimmel a lot, and I was pleasantly surprised that he wasn't a guy that I liked when I was a kid. And then when I watched his stuff as when I got older, I was like, oh, I don't really, I don't, I don't know why I liked this. Like, uh, you know, about, we mentioned Pablo Francisco earlier. He's a guy like that. Right. I loved Pablo Francisco when I was a kid. Because he did, you know, crazy voices and sounds and all this shit. Yeah. And, you know, when I watch him as an adult, I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I have no interest it. in this. Yeah. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised to find out that Schimmel was not one of those guys. But so we talked about all this tragedy in his life. I personally am was uh, happy to find that, you know, he beat cancer. He did beat cancer. But <laughs> we mentioned all the tragedy in his life. And you almost wonder if cancer would have been a better way to go uh, <laughs> because Robert Schimmel died in 2010. And here's the crazy part. Uh, I had thought he died. He called into Stern saying he was on the wait list for a liver transplant for the cirrhosis that he was diagnosed with. So I kind of thought that's how he died. I didn't realize he died in a horrible car accident where his daughter was driving and, uh, you know, tried to a little defensive driving where she uh, got T-boned by another car and the car ended up flipping over. It was a horrible accident. Uh, his son was in the back seat and survived. He didn't get hurt. What's that? He didn't even get hurt. Oh, the son didn't get hurt at all? No, un unharmed. Yeah. Well, uh, his daughter didn't do so well. Lost her. By the way, 19 and her name was Aaliyah. So don't name your daughters Aaliyah, folks. It's not going to be a pretty <laughs> end. <laughs> um, but uh, Schimmel obviously died uh, in that accident. He hung on for a couple of days. Um, I think they brought him to the hospital and he died like two days later, which must have been absolutely brutal. Horrible. It's it's insane. It's almost like a it almost feels like a Schimmel punchline where he survived a heart attack lung cancer, cirrhosis, I'm not lung cancer, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, losing a testicle, chemotherapy, all this stuff, and then he dies in a car accident. It's crazy. That's a terrible way to go. And, you know, I've, I think the saddest part is that his daughter went also, obviously. Um, he had f five kids, I believe he was survived. There's six kids total and uh, five, obviously, when he passed. Um, so that's obviously the saddest part, but you know, then just from a comedy perspective, a thing that stands out to you, like this is right in the middle. 2010 is right in the middle of Geraldo and Patrice time. Geraldo in 09 and Patrice in 2011. Now, I think both of those guys are a lot better comics than Schimmel. I think they're a lot funnier. But it is it just kind of speaks to the, you know, flying under the radar, completely unknown career that Schimmel had. And I think there are pockets, particularly Stern fans. We'll listen to this episode and go, what are you talking about? I knew Robert Schimmel, but that's about it. Like, I don't think other pockets of uh, the world really knew who Robert Schimmel was. And then even in his death where like, you know, Geraldo had a documentary made about him. Patrice has obviously had benefits. And I think not so much Geraldo, but Patrice has almost gotten more popular in death than he was in life. But Schimmel's death at the time, I don't even, and I was old enough. I was like 19 when he died. I don't remember that even really being a blip. I don't remember anyone talking about it. Um, so, you know, kind of a, a sad career, but you can always go back and, you know, discover him on YouTube, which was the point of this episode, I guess. So uh, what's your grade, Craig, after listening to him? You a fan of Schimmel? Oh, I, I like I like the because uh, he's also kind of deadpan, too. He very. Yeah. Which I, I, I think is a good combo for especially when you don't know what's coming. So he right. could just say like a joke. Or you could say something horrible, like, you know. Yeah, there's a little Stephen Wright in there almost. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, if you like the episode, then hopefully you go down a shim shimmel rabbit hole because um, there's plenty out there. Like I said, I would check out his special um, Life Since Then, which I think is entirely on YouTube. It's in parts, but you can find it all. Um, it doesn't appear that Aaliyah died from this car accident, actually. Oh, no? No. 
Oh, thank you. I know she was horribly injured. She was definitely injured, but uh, it looks like she had a, a message after. He was dead already, but she posted right. a message. Um, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I can't. Oh, well, thank God you called me out on that because I'd hate to leave on that note. <laughs> See, everyone, I look stuff up. The <laughs> <laughs> Excellent work, Craig. Eh, round of applause, everybody. Um, oh, that's interesting because then maybe I'm just off on the number of kids he had. He because I thought he, had, I thought he had six kids total, and every news report I saw said survived by his five children. Uh, his son, Derek, died of... Leukemia. Oh, right, of course. I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I like that I'm just doing I'm I'm counting her out based on math. I'm like, well, she was dead. <laughs> Still watch the Olia name though. I think that stands. Uh, so well, at least I got a good joke out of it, even though it wasn't accurate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, shout out Aaliyah Schimmel. I'm sorry for reporting your death. I hope that gets clipped and she gets tagged with it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um all right, everybody. Uh so rest in peace, Robert Schimmel. Aaliyah Schimmel lives on. And uh, we will talk to you guys next week on Why Are You Laughing? Wow. Wow. I, I don't know if I could live up to that. Um, <laughs> boy, it's really exciting for me to be here. Um, you know, uh, a lot's happened since the last time I shot a, a, a comedy special. Um, I got my own TV show. Then I got cancer. Ah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Nothing's that good in my life. Don't jump in like that. <laughs> so I got cancer, then I lost the TV show. And I lost a ball. Not to cancer, my insurance has a fucked up copay. <laughs> and, uh, and I met my soulmate. And then I lost my wife when she found out about the soulmate. <laughs> And then she sued me for divorce, and then I lost the house, and now I'm remarried. But more than that, I'm back. I'm back eight years. Thank you.